Resveratrol made headlines in 2006 where some research showed that it could increase the survival in mice that were fed a high calorie diet. It also seemed to improve muscle function, insulin sensitivity and boost the mitochondrial number. And it was thought that resveratrol was doing this by activating an enzyme called sirtuin-1. So to explain why I've stopped taking resveratrol, we need to go through the timeline, starting with the initial excitement in 2006, the controversy in 2010, the counter to that controversy, and then a couple of knockout blows, with the latest one coming last year in 2020. I'll also share with you what I do instead of taking resveratrol, and then we'll finish up with an apology to all of you. So let's get into it. So first of all, what are sirtuins? So there's an enzyme in yeast called Silent Information Regulator 2, or SIR2, which is now also known as sirtuins. And it's this enzyme that generated so much excitement. Because in 1999, a second copy of SIR2 was put into yeast, and it extended the yeast lifespan by 30%. Around that time, it was also suggested that the beneficial effects of calorie restriction were because of SIR2. Now, mammals have got seven different sirtuin enzymes, and it's sirtuin-1 that's the most similar to the yeast SIR2. So now the race is on to find a molecule that will activate sirtuin-1 and hopefully extend the lifespan of mammals. So that brings us to 2003, where a lab suggested that resveratrol is a potent activator of sirtuin-1. And that 2003 trial was a petri dish trial where they looked at individual cells. Now we need to see whether this resveratrol theory is going to play out in mammals. So that brings us to a mice trial in 2006, where that trial, it claimed that resveratrol shifts the physiology of middle-aged mice on a high-calorie diet towards that of mice on a standard diet and significantly increased their survival. So it produced changes associated with longer lifespan, it reduced insulin-like growth factor 1 levels, and it boosted the mitochondrial number and improved muscle function. So after publishing that paper, it seems like science had figured out a way to extend lifespan and to boost muscle function. So naturally, there was a lot of excitement around resveratrol, and the company that owned the intellectual property around resveratrol was called Sertris. So Glasgow Smith Klein it bought out Sertris for $720 million in 2008, thinking that resveratrol was going to be the next big thing in health. But then came the controversy. A group from Amgen in 2009 wanted to figure out whether resveratrol actually activated sirtuins in the first place. And what they found was pretty shocking. It seems that there was a flaw in the fluorescence that was used to figure out if the sirtuins are being activated or not. And what this group found is that resveratrol, it doesn't activate sirtuin-1 in these petri dish cells. And the group concluded that this data, it challenges the idea that resveratrol can be used as a way to directly activate sirtuin-1. So overall, this group at Amgen was suggesting that there was an issue with the way in which the sirtuins were being measured. It wasn't the resveratrol that was activating the sirtuins, it was the fluorescence that was activating the sirtuins. And this finding was backed up in 2010, where a separate study also suggested that resveratrol it doesn't lead to an activation of sirtuins, instead what was happening was an issue with the fluorescence. So that is a remarkable finding. These groups were suggesting that the initial excitement around resveratrol activating sirtuins, it was nothing more than a lab error. Nonetheless, Glasgow Smith Klein continued with their trials, looking into resveratrol. And that brings us onto a trial of 24 patients that had multiple myeloma. Now, because resveratrol has a low bioavailability, Glasgow Smith Klein used a micronized oral formulation of resveratrol, and unfortunately kidney failure happened in the first two cycles of giving resveratrol. To make matters worse, the multiple myeloma it continued to progress in four out of five patients at the time of their kidney failure, and two patients had to be discharged for palliation. Following these cases, a medical review meeting recommended further monitoring and recruitment needs to be stopped following these serious adverse events. The paper finishes by concluding, this study demonstrates an unacceptable safety profile and minimal effect in patients with multiple myeloma. So this study of resveratrol was stopped early because it was causing kidney failure, and unfortunately, those patients passed away. And after that failure, coupled with the new evidence that resveratrol probably doesn't activate sirtuins directly, 
Glasgow Smith Klein stopped development of resveratrol. Instead, they started focusing their efforts on selective sirtuin activator compounds that have got no chemical relationship to resveratrol. So far then, we've got evidence that resveratrol, it doesn't directly activate sirtuins. And Glasgow Smith Klein, that paid $720 million, wanting to do everything possible to get resveratrol onto the market, they've stopped development. So after five years of owning Sertra's pharmaceuticals, Glasgow Smith Klein shut the doors. Now one of the famous arguments for why resveratrol wasn't having an effect in clinical trials was because it wasn't being absorbed. That it needed to be mixed with a fat such as yogurt or olive oil. But like we've gone through, the issue isn't absorption. The issue is how resveratrol actually works. We've got a lot of data showing that resveratrol doesn't directly activate sirtuins. And those experiments are cells in a petri dish where resveratrol is given to those cells. Again, they can see that resveratrol doesn't directly activate sirtuins. So it's not an issue of absorption. It's an issue with how resveratrol actually works. But I also want to pose it to you. Glasgow Smith Klein spent millions and millions of dollars. Surely it's a bit patronizing to suggest that the only reason why they shuttered the doors on resveratrol was because they hadn't thought of pairing resveratrol with a fatty food. Do you really think they didn't try and get a return on their investment by considering this possibility? But out of this disappointment, there was a sirtuin activating compound that was discovered that made it through the initial safety trials in healthy volunteers. So if this theory of activating sirtuins works, then we should see awesome benefits in type 2 diabetics. So that's exactly what Glasgow Smith Klein wanted to have a look at. So they tested type 2 diabetics with this molecule that activates sirtuins, and unfortunately, it didn't lead to any consistent dose-related changes in blood sugar levels or insulin. Which once again is an alarming finding. We've got a molecule that now activates sirtuins, but it's not helping type 2 diabetics. So it does beg the question, will activating sirtuins with molecules or medications help? Because there is some controversy with activating sirtuins. So the role of sirtuins in lifespan extension by calorie restriction has long been challenged because there's several reports showing that sirtuins aren't required for the lifespan extension by calorie restriction in yeast, C. elegans, or fruit flies. Even the deletion of all sirtuins in yeast doesn't prevent the effects of calorie restriction. Okay. But even if resveratrol doesn't directly activate sirtuins, maybe it still helps. So to explore this idea, we've got a randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind trial that tried to figure out if resveratrol can help in low-grade inflammation associated with obesity and metabolic syndrome. So they took people with an average age of 50 who suffered from obesity, and they divided them into three groups. One group took 1,000 milligrams of resveratrol, another group took 150 milligrams, and the final group took placebo. And they did this trial for 16 weeks. Resveratrol did not improve inflammation, blood sugar level, blood pressure, or fatty liver. Instead, rather shockingly, resveratrol, it significantly increased total cholesterol compared to placebo. So not only does resveratrol not appear to directly activate sirtuins, but it may increase our cholesterol levels. And the final knockout punch for the theory that resveratrol activates sirtuins was a study that was done in 2020, and it used CRISPR technology, which is cutting edge. Using this technology, it shows that resveratrol had very similar properties to another molecule called hydroxyurea that causes cell stress. This study also proved that resveratrol and terostilbene, they do not directly activate sirtuins. Instead, these results establish that the primary impact of resveratrol on human cells is by causing low-level stress. So that experiment used the most cutting-edge technology that we've got when looking at genes. So using CRISPR technology, we can see that resveratrol doesn't directly activate sirtuins. Instead, what resveratrol is doing is stressing the cell. So since resveratrol stresses the cell, that brings us onto the other argument for taking resveratrol, in that resveratrol helps exercise benefits. So to test this theory, there was a study done on 27 inactive but otherwise healthy men, and half of them took 250 milligrams of resveratrol, whereas the other half took placebo, and they did this study for 8 weeks. Both groups did high-intensity exercise training, 
What they found is that there was a 45% greater increase in the maximal oxygen uptake in the placebo group compared to resveratrol. So overall, resveratrol, it stops the positive effects on exercise. And once again, resveratrol, it also worsened cholesterol levels. And just as a side note, in this trial, sirtuin one it wasn't affected by resveratrol supplementation. And it wasn't just one trial that confirmed this. We've got a second trial that again shows the same thing. So let's sum things up. We've got good evidence showing that resveratrol doesn't directly activate sirtuins. Instead, it stresses the cell. But unfortunately, that stress doesn't seem to be good for us. It boosts cholesterol and it seems to get in the way of exercise benefits. So why would anyone take it? And this is where I do need to apologize to all of you who follow my channel. So I try and focus on the evidence pyramid as in what the good human clinical trials show. When I first started looking into resveratrol and making videos on it, I got caught up in opinion and hype which clouded my judgment when I looked at these trials. And I'm sorry. This journey to figuring out that resveratrol and pterostilbene, it likely does more harm to healthy aging than good. It's been truly humbling and I'm disappointed that I didn't see this earlier. All I can say to you is, again, I'm sorry and I'm going to strive to always do better. As of right now, instead of taking resveratrol, I make sure to eat a good diet, I exercise regularly, I do safe fasting, and I support my NAD levels by taking a molecule called niacin. When I reach my mid to late 30s, that's when I'll reintroduce NR or NMN. So I really hope you found this video useful about resveratrol and pterostilbene. And I want to give a massive thank you to all of my patrons who support the channel. So until next time, thanks very much.